Hello and welcome to Mr Pi the Maths Guy. In this episode I'd like to look at the concept of number. Now whilst not all maths includes number, and certainly there are aspects of maths that children might study much later, where number is not at all a significant part. But it's fair to say that most of the maths that children would be doing in school, and certainly most of the maths that we do outside of school, does involve a large amount of understanding numbers. With that in mind, it's really important that children have a really good grasp of our number system. After all, if they can't understand the number system, they will have difficulty and struggle with adding other information into that and using that number system to make sense of other aspects of maths. So I think it's vitally important that we really spend a little bit of time getting clear what we mean by numbers. Now numbers have three key aspects to them. There is the spoken language of number, there is the written form of that spoken language, and then there is the symbolic representation of numbers that are used in things like equations, telephone numbers, prices, etc. Now if we look at this language of number, this came about long before any written um, symbolic representation was ever conceived. And the language of number was generated, at least in part, by the relevance of the way things were in life at that time. We can see this in our own number system. And if we look at the numbers up to 20, we can see that up to 12, each of those numbers has a relatively unique name. Little or no connection is made between different numbers in those 12. But when we go to 13 up to 19, we can see that these numbers follow much more of a pattern. We can see, for example, if we look at the word 14, that it contains the word 4. And actually, we can uh, work from there that the number 14 is based on 4 and 10. This is repeated in other numbers like 16, 17, 18 and 19, where it's really clear to see. And with a little bit more thought, we can even see that this also applies in the case of 13 and 15. Now this difference between the way the numbers are generated as a language and how we represent them in a symbolic form can cause confusion for children. For example, we have the word 14. We also have the word 40 and they are very different in value but children can easily get those two words mixed up and say 40 when they mean 14. The similarity is so great that this is a real problem for children. We have the same with 13 and 30, 50 and 15 and 60 and 16 and so on. So it's really important that when we listen to children, if they are counting numbers, that we listen out for those slips and help them to correct them. Gently saying to them, it's not 40, it's 14 and getting them to see the difference. Now the other aspect of the written form of the spoken language is the spelling. Now the spelling of English is uh, an issue of all of its own and I'm sure I don't need to tell people that the English language spelling is a little bit obscure. That's mainly because words come to our language from many many sources. So the spellings and how those words are originated is driven by the language from which they originally came to us. But within the number system we have a problem with spellings also. For example, if we look at the numbers up to 19, the E sound in any of those numbers, 3, 13, 17 and so on, all use a double E for the spelling. But when we get to the word 20, and 30, we use a Y to create that same sound. Again, this can be an area for confusion with children. 
to helping them recognise the different way the E sound is spelt in those words can be quite helpful. Now I'd like to look at the way we symbolically represent number. Man has for thousands of years tried to find ways of recording number in a much quicker way than just writing down words. After all, if we had to write a telephone number these days down using only written forms of the spoken language, we'd need very big cards to hand to people when we say, would you like my phone number? It would also be very difficult sometimes to read that card and actually dial the number. So symbolic representation of number is really important. Now we're used to our number system in the, in the UK and actually in fact we find that that number system is used by the vast majority of the world. And it might be easy to assume from that that that's the way it's always been, that that is how numbers were and therefore that is it. That's the end of the story. We couldn't be much further from the truth. The history of number symbols is a very long history and it goes right back to the Egyptians and long before that. Now around 3,000 years ago the Egyptians had a number system based on simplified pictures and they would have pictures of like a, a, a staff or a rod for numbers between 1 and 9, for numbers of 10 value, 10, 20, 30, 40 and so on, they would have a simplified uh, heel bone, a rope could be used for numbers of the hundreds and a lotus flower for the numbers of a thousand and for ten thousand it was a pointed finger. So as you can see here by looking at these symbols for the Egyptian system, to write the number one we just simply draw one staff or one rod. If we want to write ten we simply draw one heel bone. But if I want to write the number 24, I would need to draw two heel bones and four staff. To write the, any numbers above that, I would use a combination of multiples of each of the relevant symbols. Consequently, to read the Egyptian number symbols, we need to be able to count how many symbols there are. And obviously writing in large numbers can become quite complex and have many symbols that we need to count and work out. Now clearly we can't count them like we would today and then write a number. That is the number. So it can be quite confusing. You'll also note there is no symbol for nothing. Simply nothing doesn't have a symbol because it doesn't need one. If there's nothing then we need to draw absolute nothing. Now moving on, we come to the Roman numeral system. And here you can see the Roman numerals and are using letters to represent values. So we have the letter I for 1, V for 5, X for 10, L for 50 and so on. And we create again the numbers by using multiple representations of each symbol. So the number 3 is I, I, I. The number 10 is X, the number 11 would be XI. Now the slightly unique thing about the Roman numerals is that they also used numbers of 1 before or 10 before and so on. So if I wanted to write the number 4, I wouldn't put I, 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 I. I would simply say I'm looking for the number that is 1 before 5. So I would draw IV, one number before 5, that is 4. Similarly, 9 is one number before 10, so it would be written as IX. Again, this system involves you counting the symbols that are being used and turning those into an understanding of the number. This system was used from very early on in the Roman Empire right through till almost the Middle Ages in Europe. 
So it's a really important number system. And there are lots of remnants of that number system still in use today. For example, often on the clock face we will see Roman numerals. We see them in books for certain pages, maybe the introductory pages in a book, or the glossary pages at the back, or something like that. It's also used, interestingly, in law. So when you look at law documents, Acts of Parliament and so on, you will often find that the Roman numerals are used in place of our modern number system. That brings us on nicely to where our modern system came from. The system we are using now of nine symbols to represent the nine values, one through nine, and a symbol for zero, actually originates in the Arab world. And they started their system, the Arabic numerals, and they again had nine symbols. One, two, three, all the way through to nine. So you can see here the nine symbols they use for the nine values, one to nine. As you can see, like the earlier number systems, there is no digit or no symbol for zero. Again, the idea being that if you had nothing, you didn't need to write anything. Now this was identified as a problem by a Persian mathematician uh, named Muhammad ibn Musa al Khwarazmi. Forgive me if I pronounce his name wrong. And he realised that in writing numbers down, he had a problem when there was no value in either one of the columns. So for example, if he had a value for the hundreds and a value for the ones or units, but no value for the tens, it was very difficult for to make that clear. And he suggested that actually if there was no value in that particular column, that they would simply draw a circle in that column to indicate there was no value there. In other words, that that little column was empty. From that word empty, the Arabic word is sif. And sif means empty. And we can see that actually the word sif, by various changes of language over a period of time, is ended up being morphed into the word zero. Interestingly, the word sif is also morphed into the word cipher meaning code and it's not a, a, a coincidence that they all come from the same sort of source. Now as you can see the Arabic numbers have some similarities with ours particularly the number 9 and you can see that 99 in our current Hindu Arabic system or European Hindu Arabic system is very similar to 99 in the Arabic system. Now. The current Arabic system represents zero as a dot, whilst in our own, as is, we use that notion of a zero as a, sing, a circle or something similar to an O. Now that leads us nicely onto the idea of place value, that a number is represented by both the value of the digit and whereabouts in that number it is. Now that's something I'm going to be talking about in my next episode. So I hope you can come back and we can look at place value and the importance of that and how much difficulty it can cause in learning our number system. So until then, go figure. Bye.